as we're like maybe a few steps from the house, I was like already my pants were soaking wet. So I was like, for sure it's broke, but let's just go on our walk. Welcome to Life Unleashed. The podcast all about creating the best life for you and your furry best friend. If you're a dog mom on the go, juggling life, work, and the endless joys of being a dog parent, then you're in the right place. I'm Danny, And I'm Nick. And together with the incredible dog mom community from Tales Up Pup, we're here to share advice, stories, and the obsession we have over the love for our dogs. Get ready to laugh, learn, and lean on each other because life with your dog just got even more awesome. We are back and we have a a new co-star here with us he is a little fussy so if you hear any peeps from the <laughs> peanut gallery it is our newest edition Callan. if you missed the memo which i don't know how you made it on the podcast and didn't see but we had our baby it was a experience we are here to share our birth story we weren't going to share it but lots of people have been asking so we are going to share it we will give a little disclaimer that it is not glamorous <laughs> it was not what we expected if you are looking for a happy positive birth story then this is probably not the one for you but this is our reality what our experience was like and it is very situational, so don't think because we didn't have the best experience that this will happen to you. And the last podcast we did kind of was like literally right before the birth, so that would be a good one to listen to if you didn't listen to it before. Kind of like you can hear a lot of the things that we're talking about, our expectations, things like that. And we'll talk about that a little bit in this one, but um, I think that'll be an interesting. I'd like to actually go back and listen to it like in hindsight now that we know what's happened and everything. Yeah, it would be interesting to hear exactly what we said. I know what we had hoped for. Um, basically, we wanted an unmedicated birth and for things to go as smoothly as possible in that realm. And we did start that way. So we'll just kind of tell the story of how things happened. And from point A to point Z, it was a very crazy experience. Um, also, if you missed our Instagram stories, our baby's name is Callan. We had a boy. Um, we waited nine months to find out. And... It is a boy, um, and he was in the NICU for a few days while we were in the hospital. So we had a wild ride. Not trying to gloat, but I know so many of you guys thought it was going to be a girl. So <laughs> it's a boy. <laughs> I think most people thought it was a girl, and we even did like a final poll, and it was like 70% girl. Everyone we asked thought it was a girl. So everyone was shocked to find out it was a boy. And people were messaging me like, you're the first person I ever guessed wrong or like in 12 years, I've never gotten someone's wrong until you. It's, it was funny to hear all the people who were surprised that it was a boy. Yeah, starting out on a very positive note, it was so cool to like have waited to know the gender and then like being able to see that it was a boy. Like, and I think you even, even though I know that you are a little more hoping for a girl, I think you still thought the experience is cool. Oh, it was so cool. I would definitely do it again. Um, we're not sure if we'll do it for our second kid, but for this first time experience, like you're glad you did it. So glad we did it. And I would choose to do that all again. I think there's pros and cons to doing, you know, to finding out and to not finding out. And it's just like a once in a lifetime experience. Now, the way that he came into the world and how I ended up finding out it was a boy wasn't what I expected because we'll get to that. But um, it still was really cool. The other thing that I'll say is kind of like a disclaimer before we go into like the whole story is this has a obviously very positive ending. Callan's here. Callan's very healthy. And we're so thankful and blessed that like everything worked out smoothly. Um, so I'll in say that end. in the end. So I'll <laughs> say that to, you know, like there's a silver lining throughout and it's a very positive ending. Yes. So yeah, where should we start? I, I feel like I'm going to forget a lot of things along the oh, way. I remember everything, Danny. <gasps> so his due date was August 11th. Is that accurate? Yes. Which was a, <laughs> which was a Sunday. That was supposed to be a Sunday. Yes. So we woke up the next morning, right? Yeah, Monday due morning. Due date came and went. We woke up the next morning. It was Monday morning, the 12th. And oh, I think actually we have to back up a little bit. Okay. <laughs> so Leading up to the last, really the last week and a half, two weeks um, before the due date was supposed to be here, Danielle was diagnosed with um, hypertension, gestational hypertension, and then that really turned into preeclampsia right at the end. And for a few weeks, I had high blood pressure and my whole life and my whole pregnancy, I was very healthy. Baby was very healthy. We had nothing on our radar. So it was very surprising when my um, blood pressure started changing and becoming high. So 
that was not good. And then, yeah, as we approached the due date, they really wanted to induce me and I did not want to be induced. Uh, I wanted to have an unmedicated birth. And I know that if you start with one thing, a lot of times it is that domino effect of interventions and medication. So I wanted to do everything in our power to not have an induction. And so we had a few appointments um, in the, like those seven days basically, because they really were keeping an eye on me and the baby, making sure we were okay. And they tried to send us twice for induction. And we said, can we please just wait until at least the due date? They actually scheduled us for Friday. So it was going to be like what, five days past the due date. Well, I think it's important to note. So going into that Sunday, we were planning to go to the doctor that Monday, which was the day after his due date, the 12th. That's when we were planning to go. Um, that morning, They we didn't know when our, at this point, it was kind of like we were on call for a scheduled induction. They said it could be within the next seven days. They weren't sure. Um, we had been told that they were really full and it likely wouldn't happen at least, you know, within the next few days, if not to- towards the end of the week. So we were- Even though it was a medical induction and I had preeclampsia, there still wasn't room to induce us, which was crazy. Right. So they, we were planning to go to an appointment that Monday. We- We actually were going to call the doctor's office um, to see like, you know, should we come, you know, to the doctors? Do we need to go to triage? Because it seems like they really wanted to, you know, get the induction going. We actually have to back up again, though, because we missed a few things. Oh, gosh. Because they wanted to induce us and we did it or me and they and I didn't want to be induced. The first intervention that I was willing to take was a membrane sweep, which is uh, technically trying to induce without medication. That's right. So I had gotten a membrane sweep on Friday Friday at my doctor's office. And they said, if it doesn't do anything, then you can get a second one. So I actually ended up going into the hospital to get it because it was Sunday. And so that's right. I got the membrane sweep second time and I kind of was losing hope. But we had done two membrane sweeps, sweeps before all this happened. So then Monday morning rolls around and we called the doctor to say, should we be coming there? Where should we be going? And they said, we were actually about to call you because your induction is scheduled for Friday. And it was like 8 a.m. on Monday morning, right when they opened. And we and the really nice news about them telling us that is like we had kind of been in limbo on when it could be. And so that's just like a very stressful thing to be like, I have no idea they could call me in the they literally said they could call you like at midnight and be like, you know, pack your bags because they had told us like, keep your phone on at all hours. And that's just like a very stressful thing. So when they said that to us, it was like, well, we at least now know that it will for baby will for sure be here by Friday. And we were really struggling with what to do, because if they called us for the induction, like randomly and said come in right now we just couldn't decide if we should go or not because I didn't want it obviously I wanted my baby to be healthy me to be healthy and so we would do anything if it was an induction or not to have everything be healthy but up until that point other than the hypertension the baby was perfectly fine and I was perfectly fine so it was a really hard decision on what to do and that's why we ended up calling the doctor to be like what should we do and that's when she said you're scheduled for Friday. So you're kind of just waiting it out for now, which is exactly what I wanted because statistically on your first pregnancy, 40 weeks and five days is when you are most likely to go into natural labor. And that was when the induction was scheduled for. So I was at least going to give my body the time that I felt like it needed to go into labor. So then I felt way more comfortable getting the induction. I'm like, if I didn't go into labor by then, then the induction was meant to be. And that's what we should do. So So you go. So after that phone call, we called all of our family members and said, Hey guys, we have a date. It's going to at least be the latest. It would be is Friday. That's when we're scheduled for induction. So kind of plan for that. Um, at this point there really had been no major signs of labor or anything. You know, baby wasn't coming like that day. It seemed like, so we were doing everything that we could to like naturally induce it with the curb walking and the things that you eat. And, um, my doctor said to start pumping. And so that was something I hadn't been doing. So I had been pumping for a few days and actually collecting colostrum. And I asked a few friends, like, what should I do with this? Should I just throw it out? Because unless you were going to be separated from your baby, you probably wouldn't need it because you're going to be with your baby and be able to provide like fresh 
milk and colostrum in that moment. But a few of my friends said, just save it just in case. So we ordered these little containers and I started pumping and saving all the stuff, which this is a key part of the story it ended up being very essential that I had that. So it was very, very cool that that all happened leading up. I had no idea why I was doing that other than trying to induce labor. And we will never know what it was that did induce my labor. But at nine o'clock, so one hour after the doctor called, told us about the induction and we called all of our family members, 9 a.m., um, I was sitting on the couch with Holly and I don't know if it was the way I was sitting or well, you said, you, you said, Hey Nick, I think we should, you know, go on a walk because they said you should try to be walking to help induce. So she literally told me, let's go on a walk. You got up off the couch and I was like, my pants are wet. She's like, I think I peed myself, <laughs> but I knew I didn't pee myself. And I knew that people said that that's what it feels like. So like, I was like, I think my water broke. But it wasn't a huge gush. It wasn't like it was everywhere. And so that's why I was like, I think it did. I don't know what else this would be. So let's like wait it out for a second. But let's still go on our walk. So we did go on the walk. And but it I just put a pad on just in case and put on my workout outfit and we're leaving and like as we're like maybe a few steps from the house, I was like already my pants were soaking wet. So I was like. For sure it's broke, but let's just go on our walk. I wasn't having any real contractions yet at that point. And we filmed our morning stories on Tales Up Pup Stories. And I was not saying anything about my water breaking. But someone said, oh my gosh, your belly dropped. So like, I think belly's, baby's coming soon. And I was like laughing to myself because I was like, oh, I didn't notice that. But it was funny because I was like secretly knowing my water had just broke. Yeah, like little did they know. <laughs> So we called the doctor back. We were like, we literally just hung up with you, but my water broke. And so she said, come to triage right now. And I was like, well, like how quickly do I have to be there? She's like, really? You shouldn't wait. Like you should get to the hospital. And so we skedaddled, skedaddled back from our little walk. We finished putting the rest of the things that we needed in our bag. And we called our family to say, we're going to the hospital. We are going. And everyone was like, what is going on? And the, your water <laughs> broke around 915 and we were at the hospital by 1015, 1030. And when we were in the car, I started timing my contractions. By the time we got into the parking garage, my contractions were about three minutes apart and we were getting into triage. They got us in right away. There was no waiting time for triage. And I guess the hospital was pretty empty at that point. It was Monday morning and they just got us in. They said, we have to test to make sure your water broke, but we think it did. And instantly the test came back positive. And so they admitted us right then. They said, your water broke, so you're staying. So it was, that was just like- It was getting real at that point. Yeah. My, my thought is I feel like the fact that you had a date for that Friday of the induction, I think that relaxed you. And I really feel like that's kind of what kicked off really? the water breaking. That's my thought. I mean, the other things that you were doing, I'm sure all of that helped and played a role. Like you said, it's hard to know. You cannot know which one it was, but I think it like relaxed you. I think that helped because it was like, seemed very interesting that like once you got that news less than an hour later, the water broke. Yeah. Cause you were way more relaxed and you were like admittedly saying like, you know, I'm so glad that we now have a schedule. Yeah. It was, you were true. feeling great about that. When we got to the hospital in triage, like our nurses were so nice and we just like had a great experience as we got there. Along the way, every person that like we kind of interacted with, you know, would be like, okay, so, you know, boy, girl. And we, every time we would tell them, you know, we don't know, we're you know going to be finding out soon that like tied, everyone got so excited when we said we didn't know. And like everyone like kind of came back later on to like find out what we had. Yeah, that was really fun. Everyone was tied to like the outcome. So this is August 12th at 1030 in the morning. We get admitted to the hospital, but they kept us in triage for a little bit. Like it, it probably was like an hour or two before we got into our actual room. Yeah, we weren't in the room until at least noon. So we are, we had taken a tour of the hospital. They showed us and they said some rooms have windows and some don't. So this nurse is walking us to our room and I said, "Ooh, are we one of the lucky ones to get a window? And she said, actually this room doesn't have a window but there's other rooms available like if you want to move then you can move she said i'm gonna put you in she's like i was gonna put you in room 12 but let me see if room 13 has a window and 12 
room 12. It was the 12th of August. And so I said, you know, it really doesn't matter if there's a window, but I think it would feel a little less jail like if we had a window. So if there's one available, let's take it. So she moves us to room 13, which Nick has a theory that that's why baby ended up coming on the 13th instead of the 12th. The only reason I say it is immediately when she said room 13, I was like, baby's going to not be born today. Baby's going to be, I was like, ba- if we get room 12, baby's going to be born on the 12th. If we get room 13, baby's going to be born on the 13th. If he would have told me that, I would have taken the windowless room, but we took the one with the window. That definitely didn't affect the outcome, but in my mind went there. <laughs> well, we were glad that we had a window because it was brighter. It was just like, I don't know. It felt like more like a hotel than a jail cell. Yep. And the room was really nice. It was big. But as soon as we got in the room, like my contractions were much uh, more intense, more intense. And the, the, they were three to four minutes apart starting in the triage room. But like they were pretty consistently right at three minutes apart um, by the time we were settled in our room around like 1230. And I was four centimeters in triage when we first got like got there. So we knew this was going to be moving and grooving. We met our nurse. Her name was Kim. And because I was going unmedicated, the nurse actually solely only had us, which typically the nurse has more than one patient. But when you have an unmedicated patient, they only have you. So it was really nice. She stayed with us the whole time. We had a great experience with her. She was super excited to find out the gender and she just made us feel very comfortable. And the unmedicated part I felt like was it was already bad because I was like in so much pain so early on but I was like you know what it feels like my body is progressing really fast so while it's very painful we can get through this fast and hopefully baby will be here soon and And you were progressing fast you were dilating very quickly and kim the nurse um her shift was over at 7 p.m but she was like this baby's gonna be here before then so she was super excited um but pretty quickly it was 2 p.m i believe when i threw up for the first time yeah danielle was kind of you were sitting in the bed and you were like oh no and like i grabbed the throw up thing and she just barely made it in there yeah so the pain was intense just the symptoms were intense and it never got better from there but nick was the best doula and support (laughs) man that you could ever have he was willing to do whatever i needed it's funny because leading up to birth I was very nervous that they weren't going to let me eat. I was like very much like I need to be able to eat, to have energy, to push his baby out. But once I was there and in that pain, I never thought about eating. Um, we were excited to be able to walk the halls and not have to be hooked up to a monitor. But I was... To bounce on the ball. Yeah. All the I, stuff you had been practicing. I was in so much pain that I couldn't imagine walking the halls. So, it was all we could do to like stand you up and to, you know, just be standing. Yeah. We stayed in our room the whole time and I did use the ball some but not like I thought I would um and yeah I feel like we just kind of moved around we kept doing different positions and I did walk around the room but it just got more and more intense as the night went on and so by 5 p.m she was like you're nine and a half centimeters you're basically all the way there there's just one tiny sliver of your cervix that won't get out of the way um they even tried moving it and she was like this baby is coming soon this little piece of cervix just needs to move so in order to get the cervix to move they put you in like a lot of different like uncomfortable positions i know they had like the peanut ball they put you like on different pieces like on your side that way another position like flipping over the other side and then they put you kind of like you know, where you were using gravity and like, I guess, leaning on the bed a certain way. They were trying all these different things. And I know like that was really not fun for you. You were in a lot of pain during that. But Kim said, this baby's coming so soon. So we're going to get this room ready for baby to be here. They turned on I don't know, the incubator thing. Yeah, they did. And they rolled in all the carts and they were telling the other nurses like this baby's coming soon. So everyone be ready. And so I was getting excited. Uh, I was watching the clock. I'm like, OK, it could be any minute now. And everyone's getting into place to have this baby. And I was like, I know Kim is off in two hours. So we got to get this show on the road so she can be here for baby's arrival. But we just were not progressing I did get 10 centimeters 
at 7 p.m. So. Yeah, but it took till 7 to really be at 10 centimeters. And that's when Kim left and handed it a us off to our new nurse Kennedy and, and she Kennedy got right into the action because we started pushing right after Kennedy got there. Yeah. So it was seven o'clock, the nurse shift change and 10 centimeters. So it was show time, go time. And we started pushing and that was crazy. But actually for me, it was less painful to push during the contraction than just to sit through the contraction. So I somewhat enjoyed the pushing because it felt better than just sitting there. And I pushed for two hours. They, at some point in the middle, were like, your baby's head needs to rock over your pelvic bone. And it's literally right there. Um, Nick actually got to see the baby's head coming and they were like trying to do everything to get me excited and encouraged to just try to get this head to rock over the pelvic bone. Yes. And so we did all these different maneuvers. Uh, we played this game called tug of war and it was just a wild ride and we could not get the baby's head over that pelvic bone. I could not. <laughs> and so it was you know, two hours of no movement at all once the baby's head got there. Right. And so, I mean, you can imagine it's Danielle was getting discouraged two hours of, you know, pushing basically as hard as you can for two hours straight with no extra progression. It was like, I can't do anything else. I've, I've gone as hard as I can for these two hours. I, I have nothing else I can do. If it's not moving, I don't know don't know what else I can be doing. So after two hours, we decided to take a break for a second. And I said, look, I cannot relax. I am in so much pain. The contractions were like, felt like a minute apart at that point. I had been 10 centimeters. I'd been pushing for two hours. There's not much I can do to relax my body at this point. So, you know, it's from 9 a.m. when my water broke. Now it is nine o'clock. Uh, yeah, nine o'clock at night. So 12 hours later. And I said, look, maybe we should try an epidural because I've done everything I can up until this point and I can't get the baby to move. So and then and the midwife had suggested like the epidural might help you relax because, you know, obviously you're in a lot of pain and we do need you to relax. Maybe that will help the baby move down beyond the pelvic bone. We all agreed that was the best step for the delivery of this baby. So they called the anesthesiologist and by the time he came and we got the epidural, it had been an hour later. So that was one of the worst hours of the whole time because in my head, I knew I wasn't going to be in this pain anymore, but I had to wait still. So it was these awful contractions, super close together. And I also knew that once he arrived, the anesthesiologist, that I was going to have to sit still and get this epidural. Yeah, very still. And like, you were in maximum pain. Yeah, because it was full on labor at that point. So he finally shows up. He is like, I don't know. I feel like your typical doctor. He just comes in. He's there to do his job, like not overly friendly. He's just there to get his job done. And I was in so much pain, but he was very like educational and like told us like, the things that were going to happen. And he was like, you have to sit still. And I just knew everything in my power. I just had to sit there and let him do what he needed to do. And we got through it. And the epidural was so different than I ever could have imagined because I could still feel my legs. I could still feel pressure. I could still feel things, but the pain aspect was then gone during the contractions. Yes. So you know, it's hard to say, like, if I were to have my first birth again, like, would I have ever chosen to go natural if I knew what the epidural was going to feel like? I mean, one of the main reasons was I wanted to be able to feel what I was doing, and I could with the epidural. So He dosed you perfectly. Yeah. You know, you hear all the different times. Some people have, you know, not enough of a dose of an epidural. Some people are dosed so much where they're like, I literally cannot feel anything. So I was, you know, in the best position. I was then able to talk. I hadn't talked for hours because I was in so much pain and I feel felt like I was just like a whole different human at that point because I was no longer in that excruciating pain. I was able to relax. Um, they put me in different positions with the peanut ball again and we waited 
until like probably 1230 to start pushing again once we felt like everything was back where it needed to be. We thought that we were going to be pushing before then. Um, but yeah, because at 11 o'clock at night, I said, Kennedy, is this baby going to come today? And she said, I think so, because, you know, every all the ducks were in a row and we were all going to be shocked if it didn't come before midnight. But we, you know, it didn't. <laughs> they, I think they just wanted to give it give baby more time to hopefully naturally come down. Cause you know, when your body's contracting baby's supposed to be kind of naturally moving down the birth canal. Yeah. So they were hoping that would be helping. And so, but 1230 was go time. That was starting to push again full on. And I pushed again for two more hours. So this is now a total of four hours and the baby had not moved at all. It was in the exact same place that it was before yeah it was it was two hours of the same like as hard as danny could push like for two straight hours and zero movement and i said look if this baby has not come out let alone moved in these two hours there is nothing else i can physically do to get this baby out i know myself i know what i'm capable of i'm doing everything to the best of my ability and if this baby is not coming out i cannot get this baby out and, and come to find out, <laughs> uh, it was impossible for the baby to come out. So we all agreed that moving. Oh, well, we missed a lot of things. I ended up getting choreo, which is an infection, um, likely because my water had broken so long ago. And the baby had meconium in me at some point in that timeline. Yeah, as he, well. The baby pooped during this and it turns out he ended up swallowing that, which, you know, was going to end up being well, we a didn't problem know that later. At this point. Well, I, we didn't know that, but I'm saying he, it turned out he had saw it and that was going to be a problem. So I had a 102 fever and they had to give me medication for choreo. And then my, because the epidural, my blood pressure ended up lowering. So then they had to give me medication to get it back up because it can be a shock to the baby who is now used to the high blood pressure to have it so low. So I was getting all these medications. Yeah, we went from zero drugs to like, it was like this drug, this drug, this drug. Literally everything was being pumped in me and I was feeling crazy. My heart rate was really high. It was just, that was not a fun time for me. And we agreed that we were going to move towards a C-section because there was nothing that we could do to get this baby out. It had been so long. And so it was 3 a.m. on August 13th when we decided that we were going to do the C-section. And by 3.50 is when baby was born. So it was not an emergency C-section because we weren't like running to get the baby out and like his heart rate wasn't dropping. Like it wasn't like that, what you see in movies, but it was very quick from the moment we said, Let's yeah, they weren't messing around. It yeah. was it happened fast. And I mean, the thing is, is like looking back, it really was not just the two hours. It really was four hours total of pushing two hours unmedicated, two hours with the epidural of baby basically being like I could see the head, the, the kind of like the crown of the head and baby hadn't moved at all during those four hours. So um, what you'll come to find out and what we came to find out was during the C-section, Danielle likely has a very narrow pelvis. and Which is surprising because I'm a normal sized person. Like I'm not a small person and you would never know that I have a small pelvis. So in the beginning when we mentioned like that this is situational and just because this was our experience doesn't mean this will happen to you. Like we had no idea my pelvis was going to be narrow and that was one of the main reasons. But we also forgot to mention that along the way in the pushing and the labor that they told me that the baby's head was swelling and I was swelling. And so we were like, yeah, the more swelling, the harder it's going to be to get this baby out. A lot of the swelling is likely because Danielle did have a, does have a smaller pelvis. And when baby's head wasn't going to, you know, fit through during the pushing phase, you're pretty much ramming the baby's head back against the, you know, pelvis bone. And that's going to, you know, <laughs> over four hours cause trauma and, you know, swelling. And so that really was not a good thing. So, they, yeah, we get rolled into the operating room. Nick had to suit up in his little sterile suit. Yep. And 
um, yeah, I get wheeled in. It was crazy. I felt so weird because I had all these medications and drugs pumped in me at this point. So I felt like I was pretty out of it. And we just, you know, got in the, and I, my biggest fear was at that point, because I had the original epidural that I could still feel a lot of things. So I was so nervous about them cutting me open when I could still feel things. And I ended up voicing it to them because I was so nervous that they were about to cut me open. I was like, y'all know I can feel things, right? And they're like, yeah, you haven't gotten the spinal, uh, block. The spinal block epidural. So once they gave me that, I was completely numb. There was no feeling anything. They did the whole thing. And he was so stuck in there. There was, They said there was no way I could have pushed the baby out. And they had to remove him so violently. It was a crazy C-section. In the beginning part of the C-section, every one part of the operating team was, you know, really calm, um, you know, all talking, doing their jobs and everything, you know, they were cutting her open. All that stuff seemed to be going smooth. And then probably a few minutes into it, um, people got very serious. I heard the doctor say or whatever. They let her go way too long. This baby's stuck. And then she really started basically being like, push here. And, and just everything, the kind of vibe in the room just changed completely. It was, it got a lot more serious very fast. We will not share every detail from the C-section because it is very traumatic and it was violent and tragic. They had two arms in Danielle's body trying to get the baby dislodged from the birth canal. And because the baby was so stuck and they were trying so hard to get him out, like Danielle was getting tugged so much on the operating table. Like clearly it was really, you know, stressful for her. Thank goodness. I don't know what the anesthesiologist pushed, but he pushed more drugs into her. That seemed to help her a little bit, but like it was getting very intense. Once they ended up ripping the baby out, literally like blood splattered all over the... <laughs> I said we weren't going to share every detail. That is TMI. <laughs> okay, I won't put that in there. You can. The whole drape got splattered. It was all over the floor. It was like very gruesome. And they had taken the baby away. So we still had not seen the baby at this point. And we were kind of just sitting there like, what just happened? And he was not crying right away. Yeah, we couldn't hear him. We could see him, but we knew it was not good. Yeah, normally, you know, when our friends that we've talked to that have had C-sections, they kind of show, put the baby over the drape, show you all these different things. The doctor took him away and took him right over. They had the respiratory team in there um, because they were suspecting it's possible that he had swallowed meconium. That just is always a possibility. He was surrounded by people. I couldn't even go over there because they were doing all this stuff to him, trying to get him to cry, basically reviving him more or less. But as soon as he was somewhat fine they did tell nick to come over and announce the gender and at that point i was so drugged up and out of it that i had no reaction when nick said it was a boy i just was laying there on the table yeah uh, so all of my hopes and anticipation of nine months were completely out the window but you did say i am happy i'm just really out of it yeah, or something like that i said something like that and it just was kind of sad that we had this hope that like the baby was going to come out and we were going to be so excited and like that just didn't happen and it was definitely tough um like for me in the situation of like i'm concerned about the baby but i'm also really concerned about danielle i didn't know you know who to be with and all of that stuff obviously my it wasn't nearly as tough for me as it was for danielle but that that was a hard thing and they let Nick do a ceremonial cutting of the cord. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they told us uh, the weight and the height and stuff like that. But we still had not like got to really hold our baby at that point. Like Nick got to do a few things. Well, but. he was very, and this is the big concern. He was like white. He was extremely pale, like his whole body. And so that's, you know, not normal. His, he wasn't really oxygen, oxygenating his blood and breathing well. So that was, that was concerning. And it felt quick to me for them to finish the whole C-section. It ended up being like a total of an hour from start to finish, I think. Yeah. But it felt quick. And they got us out of there into the post-op room. And that's where they brought us 
the baby and he his, actually latched on right away and his name was callen we people in the operating room were even asking what's like what's his, his name? name i said callen the one uh male i don't know if he was a nurse or assistant or whatever but he was trying to get us to name the baby after him but we had already picked his name out we knew we were going to name him callen sorry anthony yeah it could have been anthony if we hadn't had a name i probably could have been convinced in that moment to name him anthony but we had already picked callen so, yeah, we go in the post-op room. We get Callan. We all hung out for, like, what, maybe 30 minutes before they took him back away? Yeah, that's when somebody came in and said, we're going to need to take him to a transition area. You know, they said at least for an hour or two just to, you know, maybe, you know, help him recover and breathe a little bit better and everything. And at that um, point, we didn't really know what the transition room was or what that meant. It and seemed so, like it was going to be for a very short time. Yeah, so we... We're just hanging out and I was still very drugged up at that point and we called our family to tell them they were all pissed off because we told them that we were going to have a baby the whole day before and we hadn't given them many updates because we were going through all of those things and the last thing Nick did was get his phone so they didn't know why we hadn't said anything but once they heard the whole story then obviously everyone was understanding but they had been trying to sleep that night and then no one had a good night's sleep because they were just wondering what was going on and so we finally called them at 5 a.m and said we had a baby we had a c-section everyone was shocked and then we finally got up to our room and um that's where we learned that the transition room actually is not allowed to have any visitors because which I don't really understand. They said it's because there's other babies in there and for like the confidentiality of these babies, but that's how the NICU is. So I don't really know why, I guess. Yeah. The one thing that was kind of nice is, um, ac okay. So actually when we were in the like post-op recovery room, we were wondering like when, what, how long are we going to be in here until we go up to a room? And they were telling us like, Oh, hopefully not too long. And then we'd been in there for an hour. And then I was like, Oh, you know, it's getting, you know, at this point it was about six o'clock and we were ready for breakfast. Yeah. We were ready for <laughs> breakfast. We were ready just to like be in our room that we're going to be in for the next few days for recovery. And it was seeming like they weren't going to get us into a room until after shift change, which would probably not be until around eight in the morning to get, so that was another two hours. And I was like, this isn't like, can you please just see if you can get us in a room before then shift change, not for another hour. And so our nurse was awesome. She got us in a room and it turns out she ended up like the room that we got was one of the rooms. I guess it was the one of the ones that was open for twins. So it was a massive room. It was even bigger than our delivery room. Yeah. And usually the postpartum rooms are tiny and the ones we saw on the tour were really tiny. So we got this nice big room, um, but they did say like the smaller rooms were renovated and our room wasn't, but we did not care. We liked having all the space and it happened to be right next to the transition room. So it per worked out perfectly for us. Yeah, that was very nice. Like next door, we were able to, even though we weren't technically supposed to go over there, they let us peek our heads in they there a few times. They let us go in when there were no other babies in there. And so, but for a while, we didn't get to go see our baby. The only time we had seen our baby was right in that 30-minute window in the post-op. And then uh, Nick ended up getting to go for like five seconds but I didn't get to go. And so at this point we had announced that the baby was here and people were like, why haven't we seen a picture? Why haven't we seen a picture? And I was like, I haven't even seen my baby yet. I have given birth to this child and I have been separated. So that was really hard. Yeah, very. That was not what we were expecting at all. Obviously he needed to be in that transition area, but it still was tough. We were really expecting him to be in the transition area for at most a few hours. And the hour just kind of kept ticking by and we weren't getting a lot of updates. All, all we kind of were hearing is that, you know, every time we try to take him off the oxygen or reduce it, like he's, his oxygen saturation is not doing as well. So it was starting to get concerning. Like every time they're telling us, yeah, we're trying to transition him off the oxygen and his saturation is going down. That just obviously was not the news we wanted to hear. And because I had the infection, I had to be hooked up to like IVs and medication and yeah, you were on like a bunch of different antibiotics. Yeah. So I was stuck in the bed for a while, but yeah, that whole day he ended up being in the transition room and the whole next day he ended up being in the transition room. So on the second day in the transition room, a pediatrician came in and told us your baby's going to be moved to the NICU 
And that meant that we could go and see our baby whenever we wanted. And he was going to have better care. Yeah. It just, it seemed like it was a good thing. And so while given we, the circumstances, yeah, while we wanted him to come back into our room, given all the circumstances, it seemed like that was the best thing for him. And so we were like, okay, this is what's happening. And then not too long after another pediatrician came in and said, our NICU here is actually full. So your baby's going to be transported to a different hospital to go to their NICU. And that's where we lost it. Yeah, that was kind of the worst news. I mean, after giving birth, no parent wants their baby to be taken to a totally different hospital. Daniela just had a C-section, was recovering. It was not going to be able to go, you know, to that hospital to see the baby. I could have gone back and forth, but... I was going to stay at that hospital. They were going to send him to a different hospital. And yeah, Nick would have to decide where he was going to go. And I was going to be separated from my baby. But... Also, I forgot to say the one thing. Because our baby was in the transition transition room slash NICU, we were so grateful that we had that colostrum that I talked about in the beginning. Yes. Um, We had Nick's mom go to our house and get it out of the freezer so that we could provide colostrum to our baby even though I wasn't physically with them. And we had never planned for that. We had no NICU on our radar. The baby was perfectly healthy. We had no reason to think that we were ever going to need this. But it came in handy and we were so glad we had it. So that's just to say, you never know what you will need things for. So That colostrum was the liquid gold. (laughs) Yes. So, but our baby did receive formula because we were not with them and that's just what had to happen at the time. Yeah, he had to eat. He had to eat. Um, so we didn't really know what to do with this information about the baby being separated because I was like, I said no, but they were like, you can't say no. Your baby needs to go to the NICU and there's no beds here. But eventually we ended up having to talk to all these people and it was a whole big situation. But in a nutshell, they were able to move some things around and make a bed there for Callan. So and because he was healthy, he just needed oxygen. He wasn't like in need of all of the things that a lot of babies in the NICU need. He just needed the oxygen. So I think that was also helpful in trying to maneuver his way into a bed there (laughs) yeah and for some reason they kind of have like a protocol of how long they can stay in the transition room and he had met that time limit and so they were like well he has to go somewhere and you know it's going to be some NICU that he needs to be in so long story short he was able to stay at the hospital that was like a probably about an hour of like us being in extreme distress trying to figure out how he could stay and just that was a really like stressful time but Thankfully, he was able to stay at the same hospital. He got a room in the NICU, and then we were actually able to go see him whenever we wanted. Which ended up not being as often as like we thought and hoped because I was still on all those medications that were timed. So we had to be in our room at certain times, and the NICU, we had to walk there. And you know, by the time you go through and scrub in and do all these things, it just... We ended up going as often as we could, but it still isn't as often as you think when you're hooked up to all these medications. Yeah, we were pretty much able to get like three to four times a day at the most. And, but it was, you know, he was hooked up to machines. We couldn't really hold him that much at that point. And we just, you know, were living a life that we didn't think was going to happen at that point. But the good thing was he was progressing and he no longer needed the oxygen he needed the flow so they were like that's a good thing and then he even progressed into a different room where he needed less care and everything was on up and up from there on out and then they told us you know we think he's going to be able to come back to your room tonight and once they said that our hopes were up and we were like okay he's coming back and then we were pestering everyone like when is he coming when is he coming and everyone thought it would happen before shift change but it didn't end up happening till like 10 30 at night and we were so exhausted and then he did arrive though we were so excited so what that was thursday night yeah we got him for our final night in the hospital We were all together finally as a family, but of course the nurses come in all the time to check on everything and give you medications and all that stuff. So 
Nick's uh, sleep in the hospital was awful. Yeah, I think from Monday to Friday, I totaled seven hours of sleep. We were up for four over 40 straight hours Monday through Tuesday. You're not sleeping during any of that. And then basically because the nurse is coming in so much, the stress, all the different things. I mean, we were, I think, seven total hours of sleep from Monday to Friday. <laughs> it was... A very exhausting time, but I just wanted to get out of there. We were allowed to stay um, at least another night, and we would have if our baby hadn't come back to us, But which we had talked about all these options. But now that he was out of the NICU and we were all cleared to go home, we just wanted to go home. So we decided we were going to go home on Friday, and everything went smoothly from there on out. So... Um, it was sad because I had all these hopes and dreams of how we were going to tell our family that it was a boy and how I was going to post on social media that it was a boy and everything went out the door with our whole situation. Um, and so that was very sad for us, but it ended up being good that he ended up being healthy. He didn't have to stay in the NICU that long. And while it was a very sad start to our life together, it has gotten better since then. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely like a roller coaster of, you know, like in the beginning, everything seemed like, honestly, until probably 7 to 9 p.m., really, I'd say really even through 9 p.m., everything had been going to plan. Though her water broke, she wasn't going to have to get induced. She was progressing along. Dilation was happening great. Um, you know, we were getting into the pushing. It really seemed like everything was going more or less how we wanted it to. Obviously, the labor was a little longer. I'm sure she didn't want to throw up, and it was definitely more painful than you could ever imagine. But all of that stuff was moving in the right direction. And then, of course, the roller coaster started, and we, you know, had the C-section, then, you know, him not being able to stay with us and all of that. But like I said in the beginning, it very much ended it on a positive note, getting to all go home. He was breathing well, very healthy. So we left the hospital and got to come home on Friday. Um, our dogs had been with Nick's parents, so they got to come home on Friday and we all got to introduce each other and have a good time. And my mom was coming on Sunday. That was always the plan for her to fly in a week after my due date. We were hoping that a baby would be here and the timeline worked out perfectly. It would have been cool to have her here for the hospital experience, except for the fact that we weren't even with our baby and we just felt like it made more sense for her to be here when we got home. So that was the plan and that's what happened. And on the day, Sunday, when she was flying into town, Nick started to get sick. Yeah, I think with all the lack of sleep, stress, you know, being in a hospital with all like the bugs and sickness, like something just jumped on me and like I got sick and that was like, would have been extremely bad if I wasn't able to, you know, Danielle's recovering from a major surgery. We're trying to take care of a newborn. If Danielle's mom wouldn't have come, it would have been really tough. Yeah, it was so perfect that she was here. And the day she got here, Nick was out of commission. Um, we didn't know what he had or what he was going to develop. So we had him stay away from the baby because we didn't want the baby to get sick. And so... I was basically quarantined for the most part in the basement. Yeah. And my mom slept upstairs with me and helped me around the clock with figuring out how to feed a newborn and change a newborn and all that stuff. And I couldn't move that well because I had been sliced open. So I was still very much recovering and I was in a lot of pain. Um, my stomach was hurting so bad. It wasn't even my incision. It was just like, because I had so much swelling, I was in so much pain and I had essentially gone through labor and a C-section. Yeah, so. the doctor kept being like, you basically had a vaginal birth and a C-section, which, you know, you're going to have to recover from both of those. It was not a fun time, but we are so grateful that my mom was here so we could get through it. And Nick ended up getting better quickly. Thank God. One piece of information that I totally forgot about during the C-section, the doctor, she said this at our... Danielle's two week post op, and she definitely said it during the C section. She said in her 20 years of C section, this was the hardest extraction of a baby she has ever had. Yeah. So it was really bad. It was bad, and he was very stuck, and there was nothing I could do to get him out. So. You know, and we, thank God that our doctor, she's like four foot ten, very short, very small hands. They said that if she didn't have small hands, she may not have been able to easily get in there and to like rotate his head, you know, out of the pelvis the way that, you know, she needed to get him unstuck. Yeah. So shout out to her for having her small hands, getting the baby out in a 
somewhat timely fashion. Uh, it's hard to look back and say like, what could we have done differently? Did someone like not make the right call at some point, but it's all in hindsight and we made all the steps that we wanted to. It seemed all logical when it was happening. Yeah. We did the unmedicated. We tried the epidural. You know, nothing was working. And at the end of the day, there's no way we would have known that the baby was going to be that stuck. So I don't know how you make a different decision than how we got there. It just sucks that it took so long to get there. (laughs) And all the, you know, ups and downs, all the pain and everything you had to go through, that was no fun. Yeah. And and for Callan, too. I mean, it was really... uh, rough extraction for him (laughs) so now the question is for baby number two what will we do and at this point in time i think i would just do a scheduled c-section first of all it is dangerous to not have a c-section your second time it is doable and if that's what you choose to do you can definitely do it but for me it probably wouldn't be worth the risk to try particularly with the knowledge that it seems like you have a small narrow pelvis yeah if the pelvis is the problem then i'm not gonna get another baby out that way either so we will just do the scheduled c-section that's our plan plus my recovery would be so much better and so different if you just have a plan c-section and it would be easier for the baby to come out so that is the plan as of now um, everyone's like how are you even thinking about baby number two but we've always wanted two kids and so while our situation was pretty horrific for us uh, we still do want to have a second kid and yeah now it's hard too because like we're in the newborn trenches and it is hard but I think we will overcome it and we'll still have a second baby hopefully are you enjoying parenthood so far yes it's super cool it's very different than like you just you can't imagine pregnancy until you're pregnant you can't imagine birth until you're in it and you can't imagine newborn life until you're in it like you can do all of the knowledge you can like learn all these things but until you're physically in it you just fully can't comprehend what it's going to be like and so it's not anything like I expected I think the hardest thing for me though is trying to find time to work and get things done while being you know we were one week postpartum trying to also get some work done And that was really hard. So now we are three weeks. He turned three weeks yesterday and we're getting a little bit more in a groove. We are lucky that he sleeps pretty good at night. Um, We have done things to help that. We are following the moms on call book and we feel like that has really helped with getting him on a schedule pretty early on in life. Obviously, newborns need to eat and sleep and change the diaper and all those things so you know you're still getting lots of unbroken sleep but I feel like for the most part he's a pretty good baby yeah he does love to during the day he likes to be held a lot which makes it difficult you know if you're holding the baby you can't do all that much I think the most surprising thing to me is how he just instantly knew I was his mom like we were separated but he knew I was his mom and he loves me so much it's like so cool to see how he wants his mom so badly yeah sometimes i'll be holding him and he'll be crying and like as soon as soon as i give him to danny he's like uh mom it's so weird to me like how does he know but he just knows he knows i don't know how we wrap up this story other than you know it was crazy it got us to where we are we're lucky that we have a healthy and happy baby now and you know everything happens for a reason it's sometimes hard to understand why we probably will never understand why certain things happen to us in the hospital and that's just part of life I guess it definitely shows you to like you and we knew this going into it we had really tried to mentally prepare for any situation but obviously it's different mentally preparing and then it actually happening to you um, are, are two different things I'm glad that we did prepare for that um, but like it's just one of those I guess it's like a common trope of like you have your expectations then you have what actually happens and you know it was it was tough I think we're a prime example too of you can never know what's going to happen so like for us if we would have given birth at home and not been in a hospital like our situation could have been so different and we went through life and pregnancy as healthy as can be I've never had any health problems before and our whole entire pregnancy was perfectly fine and until the blood pressure issue which still would have been like if I wanted to have a home birth I could have and so it's crazy that if I would have chosen to do that that 
our ending could have been so different. And so it just goes to show you have no idea what's going to happen. And we were very glad that we were in a hospital and had the doctor that we needed to have. And, you know, it just, it's crazy how things happened. (laughs) Yeah, we, it was definitely way different than what we expected. That's for sure. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for being so excited for all of our birth and newborn posts. Yeah, we had so so much love and support and like particularly during that really difficult time that like meant a lot to us. Yes. So thank you guys so much and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.